it up and threw it in my face just for a laugh. And what they did, the Stones came up with something that kind of went back to the sort of bedrock, I suppose, of, of 1964, but was allied to modern technology. In February 1968, the Stones announced that they were going to be working with American producer Jimmy Miller in an attempt to realise the new sound that they were looking for. Miller had successfully broadened the sound of the band Traffic, and with the Stones' next release, he and Richard steered the group away from the more elaborate tendencies of psychedelic music. I went to a small recording studio in Morden, M-O-R-D-E-N, Morden, and uh, there was my mates Stu and Mick and Keith in the studio, and they played me, I think I was probably the first music journalist to hear Jumping Jack Flash. And I listened to it, and I went, this is amazing. Like, this is a totally different sound from what you've actually been doing before. Where have you got it from? And Keith gave me some convoluted explanation of how he'd recorded his guitar through a Philips cassette player, stood the microphone in front of the amp. I didn't really understand it. I'm not technically that good, you know. But I knew that he was telling me, you know, the, this was how they got the sound, and I knew the sound was, was something special. It was thick, and it was all enveloping, and it was exciting, and it was rock. Pop was still singles, and it was moving really fast. And you have a period of, I don't know, maybe a year, maybe longer, where the Stones have no single. Uh, we Love You was a moderate hit. Uh, Satanic Majesties paled by comparison with the Beatles stuff. Um, the Stones seemed to have vanished, more or less. I mean, if you were a 14, 15-year-old music fan in England, the Stones seem to have faded. So the impact that Jumping Jack Flash made at the time is hard to understand now. I mean, you had to be there at the time to, uh, you know, suddenly the silence was broken and with a bang, you know, with a great record. Jumping Jack Flash was the turning point. And I think that was the point at which Keith really took over, started to take over the sound of the band because he'd now got his confidence right and he realized that he'd done something a bit special just the fact that he decided to kind of you know experiment with recording the guitar that quite sort of punky lo-fi way is sort of such a it's such a rejection of of the over orchestrated aspects of of satanic majesties and it's just almost like saying we're a punk rock band <laughs> People like Jimmy Miller coming onto the scene from America were very important too at this time. They did give them a kind of transatlantic sound, if you want to call it that, a kind of uh, ubiquitous Americana with the Brit, rock, pop, whatever you want to call it thing as well, which was an amalgamation of, of, their, um, of their sound. Jimmy Miller was, was a very clever drummer. He actually played drums on one of the tracks, I think, I mean, I'm not sure. He certainly had a stab at Jumping Jack Flash at one time. And there was one track he did that Charlie couldn't do, and I think he's actually, he actually does play it on the album. Charlie was very good about that, actually. He said afterwards, I remember doing an interview with him, and he said, Jimmy Miller taught me something about drumming at that point, and I always remembered it. He wasn't a great live drummer, but he was a good drummer in the studio. And, um, and Charlie was, as usual, very gracious about that sort of thing. 
which you know, somebody else might have been quite pissed off about, I would suspect. But Jimmy Miller was, was an important factor in, in Beggar's Banquet's success, I think. Jimmy Miller was incredibly important to the Rolling Stones. I mean, Keith aptly described him, an incredible rhythm man. You know, and when you listen to, you know, those records he produced with, with, with the Stones, everything is a rhythm instrument. You know, Jagger's vocal, the guitars, everything's moving, the cowbells, all of this stuff is, is, is rolling through. He'd get into the studio and play them himself, you know, something that, you know, something that the Stones would absolutely respect. And when Jumpy Jack Flash came out, it was like, you know, somebody just kind of went and just kind of blew the fog away. I remember a friend of mine, you know, when we were kids, it just kind of come up to me and just said, God, have you heard the new Stone single? It sounds like Chuck Berry. You know, like, it, that was a good thing. <laughs> you know, that was a sense of, you know, the Stones kind of getting back to what they did best. In June, the Stones and Jimmy Miller returned to the studio to begin work on an album that would push them even further in this new direction. This process was in turn captured by the French filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard, who, at the height of his powers in the 1960s, shot a typically idiosyncratic documentary around the recording of one of the album's standout tracks, Sympathy for the Devil. I went to Olympic Studios in Barnes. I would sometimes, because I was quite close to them in the early days, because I knew Stu, I could sort of drop in at the studios and they wouldn't mind as long as I didn't make a nuisance of myself. So I did, you know, coming back from the Scotch of St. James on the Adelib. And I remember going to the studio one night and just walking in and Jean-Luc Godard was doing Sympathy with the Devil. I was filming it. And I thought, what the hell? This is amazing. What is this? You know, this is another total departure from anything the Stones had done before. And Marianne was there. And uh, she said that it stemmed from a book that she'd given Mick called the Master of Margarita. She'd given the book to Mick. Mick had got the inspiration for, for Sympathy with the Devil from that book. And I was listening to it in kind of fragments in the studio. I didn't really get the full impact of it, but I did know that there was something really different going down. OK, I thought having the solo on the third, on the fourth one, instead of the... Because it, that's the way, it's the way it sort of is, you know, the, mm. the last verse is different. Okay. So we'll have it like three verses straight through and then the solo, whatever it is. Should start off very cool. Should be very cool. Godard, despite being at the very high end of cinema, was a complete cinema guy, and that means he was a complete, he was completely interested in the developments of popular culture. In Masculin Feminin, for example, a film he shot in 65, he'd taken a French, a young French pop star and used her as the uh, main uh, uh, character. Difficult to say exactly what God I was aiming at, but on the, one plus one in general is an attempt on the one hand to take the creation of a track of the Rolling Stones at that time and juxtapose it with a whole lot of ideas about black power, revolution, feminism, etc. It seems to me that the attempt to conjugate all those other things together really doesn't work. There's moments of humour and there's moments of insight. On the other hand, as an actual documentary of the Stones actually recording a song, you have all Goddard's kind of brilliance at actually recording the moment. Um, I don't think he thought of it in any, in any way as a simple documentary, but in many ways the force of the film is actually to really show you the Stones recording a song. As well as documenting the recording process, Godard was also able to capture the changing dynamics between the various members of the band. When you see the Godard film, Sympathy for the Devil, you see this sad figure of Brian Jones in another world and he's in his little 